Now, especially even your rush, they have a special. I even noticed they got an aisle for parents with children. Did you know that? There's a cash here, ladies. Just remember this next time, those of you with children. That if you are in a rush, there's a cash here available which says mothers and children only. Now, who do you expect to be in the queue? Mothers and children only. Isn't that true? Okay. And then right next to it, if you look at it, you'll see there's a big sign that says express tills. You know what express till means? It means go very slowly, doesn't it? It means you wait for a long time yet, doesn't it? Now, what's it mean? Express. It's like going through Kentucky in express lane. You must go really fast. <laughs> but I want you to understand something here. It's supposed to be for fast. And that's what it says. And how many items are you allowed to have? You even know this. 10 to, oh, well, we give you a little bit, maybe 15 items. But really, 10 is, 10 is the measuring stick, okay? And then you are in a rush, you've got your items of 10 things, you arrive there, and you're excited about it, you, you, and then you see a person with a trolley in front of you. And they've got more than 10 items in their trolley. And you feel like tapping them on their shoulder and saying, can't you read? You start feeling a kind of stirring inside of you, don't you? Um, look at this person, I mean, can't, you know, this is express items. Do you mind if you say to your friend, hey, do you know this? This is express items. <laughs> Don't we do that? If you could, you know, and I've experienced that one person start murmuring, guess what happens to the rest? <laughs> oh. Isn't that true? Isn't that what we do? I found myself many times at a traffic light obeying the rules of the road and next to me on the pavement, <coughs> one wheel on the road and one wheel on the pavement, I see a taxi coming past. <laughs> and you always feel like you wish you could just drive a little closer to the curb because so they can't drive past. Have you seen it when somebody's trying to come into a lane? They've made a mistake, they didn't think about it. Maybe they really knew that you know that they knew. But they're trying to get into the lane and then you just move up a little closer to the car in front of you. You don't do that, hey? It's quite sad, but that's what we do when we get to rivers of Mara. We really do do the wrong things. And I want you to notice these people arrive at the river Tasted, it's bitter. And dear friends, the place was called Mara. <laughs> what did you expect? You are on planet Earth, and I just told you just now, this is what you can expect. Hard times. The Bible says that the devil goes to make war with the remnant of a seed. Those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. What are you expecting? Peace? Expecting it to be smooth going? No, I've got bad news for you. It's going to be bad. You know, that's fact, some of us are wise. We tell people who are newly baptized. We say to them, you know, up to now, things have been all right. But from now on, the devil's really going to attack you. Don't we say that? How true the words are. People turn around and say, well, you know, you told me the truth. And honestly, it's really happening like it. I've never had so many problems like I have now. We seem to be surprised by the things that are happening around us. But I was told by Solomon that a net is cast and all fish are caught in it. Did you hear that? You just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. And dear friends, I've got bad news for you. If you are a member of planet Earth, if you were born here, you're in the wrong place at the wrong time. Did you hear me? I've got good news for you. You are a special people. You know, you have got available to you, I wish it was available to everybody. It is available to everybody, but the people of Zion should be the ones that really do. Listen to this. 
So the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What are we to drink? Now that's what we do. We complain, you know, we've done what you did. And what are we to do now? You know, and we, and we, we murmur. And do you know that the sin that really grieved God about the Jewish people on their way to the promised land was they murmured all the time? Dear friends, do you murmur all the time? Murmuring once is all right. But if you're murmuring all the time, you're going to have to be in the desert for 40 years. Because people who murmur are not going to get to heaven. So let's look at this. They murmur. Look what Moses does. I tell you that they had... They, they reacted in a lovely syndrome. Well, one person complained, oh, look at the water, it's horrible. And he said, Whoa. It's like this body, you know, this banging of wings. And Moses says there in verse 23, and Moses cried out to the Lord. You know, dear friends, if I can just tell you something. In the moment when you are at the rivers of Mara, Cry out to the Lord. Did you hear me? There's a man who experienced that he had lung ca uh, a cancer. I'm not sure what cancer it was, but he cried out to God and God gave him a solution. You know who I'm talking about, don't you? Do you know who I'm talking about? Do any of you know Pastor Neil? Do some of you know Pastor Neil? Okay, he had cancer, and somehow through a wonderful revelation of God to him, he discovered, and he is in remission. Isn't that incredible? But now I want to warn you about something, dear friends, and I started off by saying it earlier on. Although that might be the solution that God gave to him when he cried out, it's not necessarily the solution to you. Did you hear me? Okay, cool. let me explain something. Moses cries out to the Lord, as it says there, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. <laughs> Who would have thought that God was going to use a piece of wood? Did any of you think of that? I mean, did anybody sitting around there think that God's going to use a piece of wood today to sort out the problem? He says to Moses, you see the piece of wood? Yes, take it, take it put it in the water. He takes it, he puts it in the water. What is he doing that's very important? He's obeying. But what did he do that was more important? He cried out to God. God says, see the stick, take it, throw it in the water. Okay, Lord, thank you very much. Takes the stick, walks over to the river, throws it in the river. And look what happens. He threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. And you know what you must do from now on every time you come to bitter waters? Look for a piece of stick. That's what you must do. Isn't that true? Go and get a stick, because the stick... If you throw it in the water, it's going to make it sweet. Is that what made the water sweet? No. What made the water sweet? No. They cried out to God. You see, I want to show you something. And I decided that I want to take you on a little journey. You know that all along in God's word, okay, I'm not going to, I think my time's chasing me. Well, I'm going to give him to you. The people have been in the wilderness for four, uh, in the desert for 40 years. Remember that. They arrived at Canaan. We're now in Joshua. Joshua is the new leader. You know who Joshua is, eh? What is the story about Joshua that's so amazing? The, the one story, the first story. What's the first story that's so amazing? There was a, a city called Jericho. Do you remember? And it had a high wall. Now, Imagine now, we all we are on our way to Zion, we are on our way to the promised land, and we come across, across this high wall. What are we to do? What's the rule? Cry out to who? You see, I'm not going to show you something. You must cry out to God, for there's a reason why you must cry out to God. They come there, the first time they arrive at the, the promised land, they see giants. They see grapes that are so big that two people have to carry a bunch of grapes. That's how big the people are that stay there. What do they do? They murmur, they cry, and then they go back into the desert. Do you remember that? Then they turn around and say, no, the Lord said we will take it, so we're going to go take it. And they went in, what happened to them? 
They got beaten up and sent back into the desert. You see, I want to tell you something, dear friends. When God tells you to do something, do it. If you decide to do it afterwards, it's too late. Because opportunity and chance comes to everybody. But if you miss the opportunity or you miss the chance, you've missed the boat. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. And you're going to see something now. I want you to see this. They arrived there. What has Joshua learned when you're in trouble? Cry to God. He sees the city. He sees the magnificent wall. The people are inside the city. They are sure of salvation. And then God does the most amazing thing. After Joshua cries out, he says, okay, this is what I want you to do. And what does he get them to do? Go with me to the book of Joshua. And I want you to look at Joshua chapter 6. And I'm going to read it if you want me to read I'll read it. It says there. Then the Lord said to Joshua. This is verse 2. I have delivered Jericho into your hands. Not I will to deliver Jericho into your hands. Did you hear that? I have. Not will. I have. Which means this is already a made up thing. It's concluded. This is what's going to happen. Uh, it's going to fall. See, I've delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Now, dear friends, I think if you had to be a person that was planning to take a city, this is the last plan that you would scheme up to take the city of Jericho. You would never think of what God is just about to tell you to do. You would think of cannons, you would think of rams, you would think of all kinds of things to break the wall down. But you will not think of what God is going to do to deliver you. He says, take them, march around the city with all the armed men. Do this for how many days? Six days. Did you hear that? Four days? Seven days? No, six days. Dear friends, I want you to listen to this. It's crucial that when God speaks, that you take every word that He's saying and you are obedient to every word. God said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Which day? Not, not the first day, not the third day, not any day you choose obedient to the word. No compromise, no adjustment. Walk around the city. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. Ark is in front. On the seventh day. Are we clear? How many days? Seventh day. March around the city. How many times this time? Seven times. I mean, dear friends, can you imagine people on Jericho looking at what's going on? They're marching around for six days once. Six days once. Six days once. Seventh day. How many times? And then all of a sudden God says, On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priest blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast, when you hear the trumpets, have all the people give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the people will go up, every man straight in. They came to the rivers of Mara. They went on their knees and prayed to God. And God gave them the solution. Now imagine this. They arrive at the next city. And there they find a city with massive walls. What they're going to do. You see, dear friends, we tend to think, okay, last time I heard, march around the city. No. Get back on your knees. I know a story of a man who was a great leader of God's word. He came to an enemy an encampment, but they were told to have little lamps. Do you remember that? But the lamps were to be covered. And in a certain moment, they were to take the lamp, shatter them, and the lights would shine, and then the people killed themselves. 
I know of another instance when there was people coming into war against them, and the most amazing thing God says, send the choir in front. Let the choir sing. And all the people get slain. Does it mean that from now on, every time you want to slay the people, send the choir out? No, but what must you do every time? Pray to God. Dear friends, because I've got news for you. You are going to come to the rivers of Mara on many occasions. The lesson you need to learn is to pray to God. And He has a thousand ways of which you do not know of solving the problem. Amen. I know of one more, and I want you to go with me to it. It's found in John chapter 9. There are others, there are so many. As I was preparing this and thinking, what am I going to share with you? I found that if I had, because I've got a limited time, I need to I need to touch a few, but the word of God is fixed. I know of a man, you know, God told his parents, don't cut his hair. Did you know that? And according to that rule, every lady in this church that's got long hair should be extremely strong. Isn't that true? And every man with short hair should be what? Is that the case? How is it then that we sometimes take things and we make those things the magic? One person told me, green juice. Another person told me, you know what? Alkaline. Body must be alkaline. Do you understand? Listen to this one, John 9. I want you to look at this because I'm doing this for a reason. When you come to the rivers of Mara, please don't ask people what they think because everybody has been given a different answer to the one that you, that is customized for you. Did you hear me? God is interested in you and he has something for you. He's not asking you to do what somebody else did. I'm going to show you this. John chapter 9. There's a man who's born blind. We have the story there. The first thing is, is it his father or is it his mother? Who is it? Who's the cause? Or is it his own sin? I mean, this is what we do. You know, we try and look for the problem. Okay, this is the problem. So when you have the problem, you know what the solution is. But in this case, there is no, there is no source of the problem. It isn't the father. It isn't the child. So who's the problem? We don't know how to solve one. You see, in the world, we are saying... Because of the, the exhaust fumes going out, the, the ozone layer has been destroyed and the polar caps are melting. So let's stop with this, you know, destroying of the ozone layer so that polar caps, and we have it and we think that's the solution. It's not the solution, dear friends. I've got bad news for you. Now. Even if we don't have exhaust fumes, you know what happened in the Amazon just recently? There was a fire. The amount of smoke that was released from there did about 10 years worth of damage to the ozone layer. Now, I didn't do it. I wasn't, I didn't like that fire. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? This world is dying according to God's word. The reason why it's dying is because there's a thing called sin. And until sin is removed, this world will continue to die. We see this man, he's born blind. And dear friends, you know, I, I praise God for things like this. That dumbfound scientists or dumbfound logical thinkers you know, when I sit down and I help a person who's got financial problems, I sit down and I look and say, hmm, you've got this amount of money in, but you spend it. Oh, man, that's bad news. Then. And you look for the problem. But sometimes you look and they've got enough money and they spend it wisely and they're still working. There is a problem. Now, what should we do when there's a problem? We should go on our knees and ask God for help, dear friends. And I tell you, you know, he's got the most amazing solutions. I wish I could say, don't forget the end of January when my son's here, I'm going to give a personal testimony. It says there, Jesus comes along, the disciples ask the question, he's certain or they're certain, I don't know, 
but that God will be glorified. Then Jesus does something amazing. I want you to look at this with me. I mean, think about this, okay? He walks up to the man, having said this, verse 6. Are you all with me there? John 9, verse 6. Having said this, he spits on the ground. I mean, I want you to look at this with me. On the ground. Now, is that what you would have expected Jesus to be doing? <laughs> no, you wouldn't have thought about that. I mean, another man is born blind and he says, Can you see? Yes. Here is on the ground, he makes mud. He takes the mud, because it doesn't stop there, mixed with the saliva, and puts it on the man's eyes. Now, in some sense, I can't look at this, and it's kind of gross, don't you think? I mean, when I was a little child, and my mom would see something dirty in my face, and you'd go like this. You just made it more dirty. You understand? You don't clean my dirtiness with spit. Especially your spit. Can you imagine this? He spits on the ground, makes my put it on his eyes. This man couldn't see what Jesus was doing. That's a good thing. Of course, would you allow someone who's just put in the ground and you can see to put that mud on your eyes? No, thank you. I remember my child when he was small, he was eating an apple. Man, and that apple was well chewed on. And then he gave it to me to have a bite. It was like chewing chewed food. <laughs> you understand? I mean, there's certain things it's like, okay, that's enough. That's the border. But here Christ does something that, that's so amazing. He spits on the ground. He makes my foot on the man's eye. Then he says to the man, you go to the pool off. So then, pool off. Go to. <laughs> I mean, that's the name of the pool. The pool's called Sent. So I'm sending you to Sent. And when you get to Sent, wash the mud of your eyes and you will see. You know what I'm amazed at, which I can't understand? Why haven't they solved all the eye problems in the world? No, it's not that. There's mud. We just go and find out the place where Jesus is back. We must be near the pool of Salem. We go and get some of that blood there. We make it into a little containers. And we put on their spit plus mud is equal to seen eyes. But you must wash it in the pool of Salem. I want to ask you this. How many people will do that? You know that a lot of people walk up to a piece of the cross and they will touch it as if the cross is the power. <laughs> a lot of people, and I'm telling you, the only reason why they haven't done this is because some people haven't read the story in John 9. But I'm sure that some people will actually go and make some money out of the place, finding out this is where Jesus back. And the problem though is, you need the, the mud there. But that mud can only be made out of the Spirit of Jesus. Now there's a reason why I'm bringing this out. You see, that was the way that that man got to see him. But it isn't the only way. The only way is Jesus. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Without me, you have nothing. So when you get to the rivers of Mara, dear friends, some people have already got to the same river that you are drinking from. And the solution that was given to them by God's grace was their solution. I'm not saying don't try it out. But I would rather prefer that you go on your knees and you say to God, I am at the river of Mara. Please guide me. Do you understand? Yes. And if you feel that your prayer is hitting the ceiling, then come to prayer meeting. Tell us at prayer meeting, I'm at the river of Mara. I need God to tell and do something for me. Won't you please pray for me? And the Bible teaches me that the prayer of a righteous man 
availeth much. Do you understand? It's time for us to take our problems to Jesus. He is the only person that can turn your bitter waters into sweet waters. May God help you to do that. Thank you, Pastor Willie.